Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us uh, this uh, night to uh, learn about sharks. We've done the craft, we've done the trivia, and now we have a, our guest speaker. We're very excited to have Donna Eret. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? All right, great. Um, and um, we're here to learn more. This is a, the, the more formal and scientific part of our late night event. So you, we hope you enjoy this nice presentation uh, by Donna Eret. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me get started here. Let me get my presentation loaded. Good, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Dr. Dana Eret. Uh, I am the uh, assistant curator of natural history at the New Jersey State Museum. And I am a paleontologist, and my area of focus uh, is fossil sharks. Uh, I study megalodon and fossil great white sharks. And so tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about what we know about megalodon, how it lived, um, and, and how it unfortunately died as well. <clears throat> So uh, I like to start off, uh, I'm a paleontologist. I always talk about taxonomy, how organisms are related to one another. And megalodon belongs to a family of sharks. Uh, we co commonly call them the megatooth sharks. They're called the odontid sharks. And they include other extinct species like uh, Cretolamna, which is a shark that lived during the age of dinosaurs and a, a species called Otodus obliquus. If you've ever bought a shark tooth necklace in a surf shop, you probably have an Otodus obliquus tooth on it. Uh, the fossil record for these sharks spans from about 90 million years ago up until three and a half million years ago. So I spoiled it, Megalodon is not still alive. Um, and the most famous of the Otodonids is Otodus megalodon, the largest shark that ever lived. So tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about megalodon. Uh, we know megalodon mostly from their teeth. Uh, most sharks, as we learned in the trivia, have skeletons made out of cartilage, and cartilage doesn't preserve that well in the fossil record, but their teeth certainly do. So if we look at the family tree of megalodon, what are some of the species that are related to, or where did megalodon come from? Uh, we can go back 75 to 80 million years to this fossil shark called Creta Lamna. And you can go to Big Brook in Monmouth County, New Jersey, a, a county park, and you can actually find teeth from Creta Lamna. You can go sifting if you follow the park rules and find your own Creta Lamna teeth. Um, but we also know that Megalodon is related to this, this shark Otodus obliquus, the tooth I held up before. Uh, there is another shark called uh, Otodus actuaticus, uh, Otodus auriculatus, this shark here, uh, Otodus angustidens, and Chubitensis as well. So there are quite a few species that are related to megalodon that we find through fossil, uh, in the fossil record through geologic time. And I'll talk more about those in a little bit. So what does uh, megalodon mean? Megalodon means big tooth. And it was originally described in the fossils by a paleontologist named Louis Agassiz back in the 1840s. And when Agassiz described megalodon, he put it in the same genus as the modern great white shark, Carcharodon. Today, we know, however, that megalodon was in a different family from the modern great whites. And he put them in the same family just because they looked similar to each other. They looked like one another. Uh, they're both big triangular teeth, right? So here I have a megalodon tooth next to a great white shark tooth. The scales are a little bit different. Uh, I'll hold up a megalodon tooth in one hand and a great white shark tooth in the other. We know today the biggest great white shark ever caught was 21 feet long, 
And as we learned in trivia, Megalodon got upwards of 50 to 60 feet long. So uh, Louis Agassiz put Megalodon in the same genus as Great Whites because the teeth are triangular, they have serrations, and they just looked kind of similar to one another. Uh, today, however, we know that there are differences. White sharks have very coarse serrations on their teeth, whereas Megalodon has very fine, tiny, small serrations. The teeth of Megalodon are much larger than white sharks. They're also much thicker than white sharks. And they have this, this band, this V-shaped area at the base of the, the tooth crown where it meets the root. And this is called a chevron or a borlet. And white sharks actually don't have this. And this is a characteristic of all of the sharks in the family, Oto o the otodonid sharks. So we put it in its own genus. When did Megalodon live? Well, as I mentioned already, Megatoo sharks have been around uh, since about 90 million years ago with Cretolamna. Uh, up until Megalodon, which lived during the Miocene time period, from about 13 to 15 million years ago, up until its extinction three and a half million years ago. Now, these sharks uh, actually replace each other in geologic time, and we call those chrono species. They replace each other chronologically through time. Uh, so we have Cretolamna down here in the Cretaceous, living alongside dinosaurs, except in the ocean. Otodus obliquus lived during the Paleocene and the Eocene time periods, about 55 million years ago to 45 million years ago. We have species like Auriculatus and Oxuaticus living during the Eocene time periods, about 40 to 45 million years ago. And species like Chubitensis living in the early Miocene about 20 million years ago, up until about 15 million years ago. So these sharks lived for a very long time. How big was Megalodon? Well, we, we saw that, uh, we learned a little bit about that in trivia already. Um, Megalodon estimates range because we only have their teeth to base our size estimates on. I like to be a little bit conservative. I usually say that Megalodon was probably 50 to 55 feet long, um, but estimates do range higher uh, and lower. <laughs> the largest great white down here in purple, uh, again, we know of was about 20 feet long. Uh, uh, this is a whale shark. We talked a little bit about whale sharks in trivia. They can get upwards of 40 to 50 feet long. And then the ancestor to Megalodon, the species of Otodus auriculatus, probably grew to lengths of 30 to 35 feet long. So Megalodon was by far the largest shark that ever lived. So looking at how they grew, how big they got, one thing that I did was I studied the growth of Megalodon. And to do that, I looked at their vertebrae, the parts of their backbone, the round discs in their backbone. And in sharks, they record uh, lines of incremental growth or lines of arrested growth, uh, much like tree rings in a tree. And so in modern shark biology, uh, biologists will cut the vertebrae of a dead shark and they can count those rings. Uh, in paleontology, um, a lot of times the vertebrae are so rare, we're not allowed to cut them up. So we, um, we x-ray them or CT scan them and then count these lines of arrested growth. And so I did that. I did that for uh, Megalodon and some of the other species related to it. So this is a picture of a vertebra from uh, Otodus megalodon. Uh, these are... Um, different species, Otodus angustidens and auriculatus, as well as Otodus obliquus. And I x-rayed all of these vertebrae and counted the, these lines of arrested growth. And I came up with age estimates for these different species of sharks in the fossil record. So the Otodus vertebrae that I was able to study, there's not too many of them out there, 
uh, came in at about 24 and uh, 18 years of age. Uh, the auricula was about 24 years of age. The angustidens was about 22, 23, and the megalodon was over 30. So these are the actual pictures of the vertebrae, and they're all scaled to size. So the megalodon vertebra is larger uh, than uh, a can of tuna fish by far. It's a very large vertebra. And so uh, this is just looking at growth rates of these types of sharks. Uh, the takeaway here is that, that most of the species, the, the ancestors, uh, um, Angusidens, Auriculatus, and Otodus obliquus, they were all about the same size as a modern great white when they were born. Megalodon, these purple Xs, however, this represents the megalodon growth, is much larger. We know that a baby megalodon shark was probably about six feet long when it was born. And looking at the, the rates of growth, how big the vertebrae, the backbone get, got as the shark grew in age is one way to look at growth rates. And what we saw was that um, a lot of the ancestors, Angustidens, Auriculatus, Otodus obliquus, when compared to modern great whites, these orange bars here, they grew at similar rates. Megalodon, however, was doing something very different. When we look at megalodon growth rates, uh, or megalodon and its ancestors' growth rates compared to one another, what I found was that Otodus, Obliquus, Auriculatus, Angustidens, all of these early ancestors, the Megalodon, grew at very similar rates to modern great white sharks and to one another. But by the time we got to Megalodon living in the Miocene time period, it was growing much faster. So we had a baby shark that was much bigger when it was born than its ancestors, and it was growing much faster than its ancestors. So how did Megalodon get so big? It was doing everything it could to get so big. It was bigger at birth than its close relatives. It was over six feet long when it was born. It grew much faster than its closer relatives. And it appears that it grew at faster rates later in its lifetime than other species closely related to it. So the answer is that Megalodon did everything it could to get really big as quickly as it could. So why did they do that? And so here we have a picture of a, a scientist sitting in a reconstructed set of Megalodon jaws. These are real teeth with fiberglass jaws. And this is actually an exhibit, uh, a traveling exhibit I helped design at the Florida Museum of Natural History with a life-size uh, metal skeleton of a megalodon, and you can see uh, this little boy walking into its mouth. Well, one question is, we know that a lot of fish are uh, cold-blooded or po poikilotherms. That means that their body temperature is not regulated inside. So maybe temperature is one reason that megalodon got so big. So I looked at the growth rates for some of these ancestors of megalodon and megalodon itself and compare them to what we know about sea surface temperatures over the last 65 million years. And what we find is that about 55 million years ago, we have some of the hottest temperatures that we've had in the last 65 million years this time called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. What we see happening with the sharks is that we actually have slower growth rates for these sharks in the warmest time period. By the time we get to Megalodon in the Miocene time period, if we look at the average sea surface temperatures, uh, when we're looking at the temperatures here across the bottom, temperatures are actually declining. So sea temperatures are actually getting colder. And by the time that Megalodon was alive, we have Arctic and Antarctic ice sheets forming. So that tells us that the, the rates of growth for Megalodon is not tied to temperature. And it begs the question that perhaps Megalodon was actually warm-blooded, or at least acted like a warm-blooded uh, animal. 
And today we know that white sharks and makos uh, also act like warm-blooded uh, animals uh, in their ecosystems. Well, what did Megalodon eat? You know, and I always say the answer is anything it wanted to. Uh, Megalodon was uh, an apex predator. It lived at the top of its food chain. Uh, the only thing the same size at this time as Megalodon was a giant sperm whale called Liviatan melvilli. Uh, which has been found uh, down in Peru and uh, in the Pacific Ocean. But Megalodon, we know, was eating marine mammals. We find many, many uh, fossil whales with bite marks uh, that are associated with Megalodon teeth. And even one or two whale skeletons have been found with Megalodon teeth associated with them. Uh, some meg teeth have actually been found with bite marks or scrape patterns uh, against them. And we, we wonder if megalodons might have been eating one another. Um, I know a recent paper came out that, uh, that states that uh, baby megalodons might have been eating their siblings uh, before they were born. You know, we don't know if these tooth marks were made when the animal was alive or after they died. We know that sharks constantly shed their teeth. So perhaps this tooth was a tooth that, that got wedged loose and the shark bit its own tooth as it was feeding. We have no way of knowing that. But some calculations that we've done uh, based on what we know about great white sharks today uh, we know that an adult female megalodon, the big 50-foot-long megalodon, would have had to average about 2,500 pounds of food a day. So we know that sharks don't have to eat every day. They can um, uh, gorge themselves on food and take a break. But on average, uh, a, a female megalodon would have to eat over 2,000 pounds of food a day. And this is a, a pyramid made of tuna cans to show you how much that would actually have to be. We know that um, the marine mammals that Megalodon was living alongside were evolving and diversifying alongside these sharks. Uh, we find the earliest ancestors to whales, things like Basilosaurus, uh, invading oceans about 50 to 55 million years ago, based on the fossil record. And interestingly enough, we see that the ancestors to Megalodon around the same time start to evolve serrations on their teeth. So this is a nototus obliquus tooth from the Paleocene about 60 million years ago, and it doesn't have any serrations. They were smooth edge teeth. This is the uh, what we call a transitional form, Otodus actuaticus, and we actually see very um, crude, very uh, ill-formed serrations on those teeth. And this species lived about 55 to 56 million years ago. So there might be some evolution of these serrations uh, in conjunction with marine mammals uh, invading these uh, ecosystems. We know that uh, some of the earliest modern groups of marine mammals, uh, things like the, the baleen whales, the mysticetes, and the toothed whales and dolphins, the uh, fistoceroids and the ziphiids and the delphinids, uh, they all evolve in the fossil record about 30 to 35 million years ago. And these are pri probably the prime source of food for Megalodon and its ancestors. So we find Mystacodon, the earliest baleen whale, about 35 and a half million years ago. Uh, some of the earliest dolphin fossils go back about 30 million years ago as well. And so what I've done here is I've plotted the uh, growth rates of the megatooth sharks compared to the diversity of marine mammals. So our growth rates are in black, showing that Megalodon has a very high growth rate. And these blue lines represent the diversity of modern marine mammals. They show up in the fossil record about 30, 35 million years ago. 
And what we find is the peak diversity of whales and dolphins in the world's oceans occurs during the Miocene time period, the same time that Megalodon was alive. So I think what we have happening here is that Megalodon probably could get much bigger. It could grow faster and get larger because there was a lot of food for it to eat. The, the marine mammals that we're finding are dolphins and some medium-sized whales, whales ranging from 10 to 20 feet long, which are prime food resources for Megalodon. Uh, another aspect of megalodon's uh, biology that we know something about is that they most likely used nursery areas like modern sharks. And so back in 2010, uh, some co-authors and I published a paper uh, hypothesizing or, or looking at a potential nursery area for baby megalodon uh, or megalodon pups, as we, we learned in our trivia earlier. Uh, off the coast of Panama. And this was based on a set of fossils that was collected during the widening of the Panama Canal that happened in the last uh, 10 or 15 years. And uh, these teeth all range from about 10 million years ago, the late Miocene time period. And we found dozens and dozens of megalodon teeth. Uh, and most of them were very small. And so what we did was we compared all of the teeth that we found from this, these sites in Panama to sites in Maryland. The, the Calvert Cliffs are a great site for finding megalodon teeth. And also uh, Florida, the Bone Valley region near Orlando, Florida. Uh, there are thousands of megalodon teeth. And we compared those and plotted their size along what we were finding from Panama. And what we found were that most of the megalodon teeth were small uh, animals. They were juveniles. And you might say, well, how do you know that they just weren't little teeth from the back of the mouth? Well, uh, megalodon teeth change shape with their age. So juvenile megalodon teeth have a different shape. Some of them have these little side cusplets, which they lose as adults. And they also have more of a heart-shaped shape to them rather than a triangular shape. And so by finding all of these teeth, these uh, during the Miocene, this would have been a shallow uh, uh, Caribbean ocean. Uh, so it would have been a per warm, shallow seas are perfect places for shark nursery areas. And that's what we see today. Uh, areas like the Bahamas are great areas for shark nurseries. So why and when did Megalodon go extinct? I hate to, to admit it, but Megalodon is not alive anymore. Um, I was lucky enough a couple years ago to go on the Discovery Channel Shark Week and talk about Megalodon and why Megalodon is not alive. It has gone extinct. Um, as I, I'll hearken back to Jurassic Park and Ian Malcolm, uh, this isn't some species that was obliterated by deforestation or building of a dam. I've changed it from dinosaurs to megalodon, had its shot, and nature selected it for its extinction. So I know that there's a lot of programs and movies out there that uh, kind of uh, lead people to believe that megalodon might be hiding out there in the Marianas Trench. But I promise you that megalodon has gone extinct. And uh, just a few years ago, some colleagues and I published a paper uh, in 2019 on the extinction of megalodon. And to do that, we examined uh, the occurrence of megalodon teeth in the fossil record, uh, especially along the coast of California. And we had very well-constrained uh, specimens. We know exactly which layer in the geological record these teeth came from. And based on the work that we did, where our, our lead author, Mr. Uh, Robert Bosenecker from the College of Charleston collected all the teeth himself, we found that megalodon teeth stopped being present about three and a half million years ago during the Pliocene period. 
So Megalodon has been extinct for at least 3 million years. And uh, unfortunately, there are no more Megalodons out there. These sharks were shallow uh, water, uh, water sharks. They lived in, on the continental shelf, feeding on whales and dolphins. And so if a Megalodon was still alive today, we would certainly have encountered them uh, with all the fishing boats and the sailing boats that we uh, uh, have out on the ocean. We would certainly see a 50 foot shark today. So why did Megalodon go extinct? And that's a much harder question to answer. Uh, I like to tell people there's no smoking gun. There's no one answer. Um, probably climate change played a part uh, 20 million years ago when Megalodon and its ancestors uh, were alive. Uh, the Earth really had very little ice on it, very little Arctic and Antarctic ice. Um, the oceans were somewhat warmer and 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 the, the, the continents were a little bit uh, shifted differently. Um, but we've had a substantial global cooling in the last uh, five to six million years compared to previously. And uh, we, you can see here the ice sheets on both the Arctic and the Antarctic. Uh, we believe that a lot of the whales that the, especially the baleen, the filter feeding whales that Megalodon is feeding on may have moved to colder parts of the globe where uh, these sharks couldn't do as well. We also know that there's a decline in marine mammal diversity. As I showed, the peak of diversity occurred uh, about 10 million years ago when Megalodon was in its prime. But we see a sharp decline in marine mammal diversity by four or five million years ago. So really, probably what happened was the buffet dried up. Megalodon got too big for its own good. And it was getting so large because there was an abundance of food items. And when those food items went away, here's a shark uh, upwards of 50 to 60 feet long that would have to average over a ton of food a day. And that food probably just wasn't there anymore. We also know that there was some competition occurring. As I mentioned, we had the giant sperm whale, Liviatan melvilli. Uh, this was living uh, primarily in the Pacific Ocean alongside Megalodon during the Miocene. And we also have the evolution of the, the first great white sharks. And they appear uh, in the fossil record about 8 million years ago. And uh, while they weren't probably directly competing with an adult Megalodon, uh, I firmly believe that these early great whites were probably directly competing with juvenile Megalodons. And this was the basis for my PhD work. Uh, I traveled down to Peru and I actually studied this specimen. This is the holotype of a fossil great white shark that I named called Carcharodon hubbelli. And as I mentioned earlier, in most shark fossils, we only find their teeth. But this specimen is extremely rare. It has preserved cartilage. So these are the articulated jaws of the specimen with over 220 teeth in position, along with 45 vertebrae from the backbone of this shark. And so I was able to tell a lot about what this early great white looked like from this specimen. And they were living in the Pacific at least 8 million years ago uh, alongside Megalodon, living in the same environments. Uh, we know that they grew to comparable sizes, uh, if not larger than modern great whites. The largest fossil great white shark tooth I've seen to date, um, based on the tooth size, would, would would uh, compare to a great white of about 30 feet in length. Uh, and we know that these fossil great whites were eating whales as well. And how do we know that? I just happened to find a chunk of whale jaw in the deserts of Peru with a fossil great white shark tooth stuck in it. And um, I published this back in 2007. Uh, this little dimple here, 
uh, actually represents a broken great white shark tooth that was broken off in the lower jaw of a fossil baleen whale about 7 million years ago uh, off the coast of Peru. So again, while the, the great whites probably weren't competing with a mod, with a, a grown adult megalodon, they were probably living close to shore and interacting with the, the juveniles and may have been out competing them. So uh, I'm going to um, wrap up by saying I, I've been talking about megalodons and great whites uh, from other places, but New Jersey has these as well. And this is an area of my current research. Uh, we actually have uh, the species Otodus obliquus. Uh, we find them in the fossil record in New Jersey. We find that transitional form Otodus exuaticus in New Jersey. Uh, we have Otodus auriculatus, this extinct species that lived during the Eocene. Uh, these teeth uh, are, are, are not that uncommon in New Jersey. Um, we have the shark Otodus chubitensis, the direct ancestor to Megalodon uh, in New Jersey. And about five or six true Megalodon teeth have been found in our state. Uh, most of them have been washed up on a beach or dredged up in the Delaware. Uh, um, so uh, probably not too many, if any, coming from the, uh, the geology, the stratigraphy on land, but their ancestors certainly uh, are common in New Jersey. Uh, um, these teeth have been found in Monmouth County, Burlington County, um, Cumberland County, uh, again, and as well as along shore uh, in um, Cape May County and, and Atlantic County as well. So I always end by asking, well, why is studying these sharks important? I mean, they're fossil sharks, they're extinct. Why are they so important? Well, they give us a lot of information about the biology of sharks today. If we know how these sharks evolved and how they interacted in the past, they can tell us something about how they interact with one another today. And we can also learn something about how sharks uh, react to climate change. We know that sharks uh, are, are in danger today. Most uh, or many species are, uh, are, um, are declining in populations due to overfishing uh, and climate change. So by learning about how sharks coped in the past, we can model what might happen in, in the future. And of course, education is important. We know that everybody loves Megalodon and you all tuned in tonight to hear me talk about it. So uh, learning more about these sharks is really important for everybody. So with that, I'm gonna end my formal lecture part and tell uh, you all to come and visit us out at the New Jersey State Museum in Trenton uh, when we reopen. We're, we're not quite reopened yet, but you can come and see uh, many different uh, fossils at the museum. And sometime, hopefully later this year, uh, I'm working on a, a shark exhibit. Uh, and so hopefully you can uh, come and see uh, our new exhibit when we reopen. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Eric. Uh this was a great presentation. Can you uh, now go and find the Google Doc for the questions? Yes, I'm going to bring that up right now. And you can stop sharing so they can see you now. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay, you can see me right now, right? Uh, we still see your desktop. Okay. Let me uh, end that. Um, let me see how I can do that. At the top, <laughs> if you if you just hover <laughs> at, at the top of the screen, you're gonna see the the bar. A bar appears that says "Stop sharing." Okay. Sorry, I can't seem to find that. <laughs> I thought I stopped sharing. Um, Excellent. Okay. Are you good now? <laughs> We're good. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, there are quite a few questions. So I'll start uh, from the top and just work my, my way down. Uh, why do sharks have so many different colors? Um, I, 
I'm going to, um, and let me see, um, Anna asked that. Uh, I assume you asked, why do shark teeth have so many different colors? Uh, yeah, there are different colors uh, with, with shark teeth. Uh, you know, the megalodon tooth I showed is almost black. Uh, this uh, Hubble eye tooth from uh, Peru, almost a, a white cream color. That's because these teeth are fossilized and they have taken up uh, the um, the minerals that are in the groundwater that have penetrated these teeth over millions and millions of years. And so they're taking up the colors of those minerals that are in the teeth. And so it'll depend on what minerals are, are present, uh, but the teeth can range in all kinds of different colors. I've seen um, ivory white megalodon teeth from, um, to, from Cuba, uh, to green ones from Florida, to orange ones uh, from uh, from uh, Peru, so that they can they can look all different. <clears throat> uh, the second question is: uh, If sharks give birth to live offspring, uh, why aren't they mammals? Uh, well, that that that's a, that's an interesting question. Uh, that's because uh, sharks actually produce eggs. Uh, but they keep those eggs internally in their body. And so there are, there are multiple different ways that sharks uh, can give birth, actually. Um, but to keep it short, uh, the, the reason is, is that they, they actually incubate them internally uh, and they can actually keep uh, live young that, that, that are born inside. But uh, these animals uh, have completely different um, systems that than than mammals do. So uh, live birth is 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 a mammal characteristic, but it's um, but it's it it has evolved in in different ways uh, through convergent evolution in in some groups. So these are not warm blooded animals uh, by any means. Uh, the next question is uh, how prevalent was megalodon compared to other species such as whales, dolphins, and other sharks? How many of them were at one time? Uh, that's really hard to say. Um, we, as we we discussed in the trivia, uh, sharks can have upwards of three hundred teeth in their mouth at any one time. Sharks constantly shed teeth uh, throughout their lifetime, and one shark can produce as many as thirty thousand teeth in its lifetime. Uh, we we learned that Greenland sharks may live a few hundred years. Uh, other species are accurately aged upwards of 60 and 70 years. So there are a lot of shark teeth out there. And even though maybe the giant, really large megalodon teeth might be fairly rare, megalodon teeth really are not that uncommon to find in the fossil record. Um, and getting an eye, a handle on population size would be extremely difficult because these teeth are constantly shedding as the animals live. Um, but suffice it to say, they were uh, they were common, and uh, they were they were uh, found throughout the the oceans. Uh, ancestors of megalodon, like uh, uh, Otodus auriculatus, has been found in Antarctica. Uh, these teeth have been dredged from the deep ocean off of New Caledonia. Uh, they're found on pretty much all continents, so they were very common uh, cosmopolitan species. Uh, where was the first megalodon tooth found? Oh, that's a good question. I'm sure um, that that they've probably been found uh, thousands of years ago. Uh, we now know there's evidence, uh, at least from uh, Maryland, that some fossil shark teeth were used by Paleo Indians. Uh, there are teeth, uh, a, a few from New Jersey as well. Uh, these are 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 mainly. Uh, uh, fossil mako teeth that were probably fashioned and actually used as spear points. And some megalodon teeth have been found in paleo Indian sites as well. So these teeth have been known for thousands of years and they've been used in different ways. Uh, how many uh, species of extinct sharks are, are there? Uh, the short answer is thousands, uh, probably tens of thousands. Uh, we're constantly uh, finding new ones as well. Um, I've uh, been fortunate enough to name uh, a couple species. 
And actually in 2020, I was co-author on a paper naming a, a new genus of extinct angel shark that lived in New Jersey. So uh, the more we, we uh, do find teeth, the more we study them in collections, uh, the more we're finding, uh, you know, new ones uh, through the, the study of them in the fossil record. Uh, the next question by Carrie was, um, uh, why did they eat their own kind? Um, well, we know that uh, in utero, in the uterus, that some of these these uh, embryonic sharks, these ones that are are doing uh, internal cannibalism, are probably doing it um, to eliminate competition. So um, they are um, reducing the the number of offspring so that they have a better chance at survival. Um, and and we we see this in some other species, you know, in things like um, alligators and crocodiles. We actually have uh, cannibalism occurring uh, for dominance. So in in some species, you know, a, a dominant male will kill other male species. Uh, probably in in the case of sharks, we know that some species eat one another. And it really probably just comes down to um, whether or not there's food available. And if a, another megalodon, the food that's available, that might be uh, what, what they're gonna eat. Uh, I don't think uh, sharks are, are too picky sometimes when it comes to their food resources. Um, uh, Kai asked, would uh, other sharks attack a megalodon? Uh, certainly not an adult megalodon. Um, I, we have no fossil evidence for this, um, but certainly, you know, a baby megalodon being born at six feet long, uh, there are other species alive. There are, um, you know, fossil tiger sharks that were uh, alive during this time. The, the great whites were evolving this time. And certainly I'm sure there was some pre predation of baby or small juvenile megalodons by other species. Um, you know, uh, tiger sharks uh, were around and got fairly large, uh, bigger than modern tiger sharks as well. So I'm sure there were uh, uh, some sharks uh, attacking baby megalodons. Spencer asked if jellyfish are related to sharks. Well, jellyfish are animals and so are sharks. So in a sense, uh, yes, we're all, they're all related very, 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 very far back in our evolutionary family tree, um, but uh, sharks are animals with backbones and jellyfish don't have backbones. And so we know that they've been uh, separated from one another for over 500 million years. Um, Christina asked, uh, which oceans did Megalodon live in? And I, I kind of answered this already, but uh, megalodon lived in all of the oceans. Uh, like I said, we we have now found megalodon teeth uh, or their ancestors on all seven continents, and um, we know that uh, they were certainly living all over the planet when they were alive. Uh, Amanda asked, "Why sharks don't have necks?" Wow, these are some interesting questions. I like them. Uh, well, sharks don't have necks because uh, they're swimming in the ocean. They have very sturdy bodies that are actually very streamlined. And sharks, uh, especially things like megalodon, great whites, and makos, uh, uh, specialize in swimming very fast. So having a, a streamlined torpedo-shaped body um, um, helps them swim faster and catch their prey. So actually having a neck would actually probably slow them down in the water column uh, when they were chasing their food. Uh, Manny would like to know, did Mosasaurs eat megalodons? And this is a, this is a good question. I like this one, Manny. Um, Mosasaurs lived during the age of dinosaurs from about 100 uh, million years ago up until their extinction 65 million years ago. And Megalodon lived from about 15 million years ago to three and a half million years ago. So Mosasaurs died out about 50 million years before any Megalodon showed up uh, in the world's oceans. So 
Uh, Mosasaurs never saw Megalodon, and Megalodon never saw Mosasaurs. Um, the next question, Jessica wants to know, did Megalodon eat tuna? Yeah, they probably did. We know uh, we find fossil tuna fish bones uh, in the same deposits that we find Megalodon teeth. So I'm sure that they probably did eat tuna. Uh, I have yet the hearer of a megalodon tooth associated with tuna bones, but I'm sure that they probably were were eating uh, tuna because they were both living the same time and at the same place. Uh, Journey asked, uh, did the ancestral species to megalodon also have nurseries near the Panama Canal? Uh, the answer to that is we have no, we really just don't know. Uh, in order to to um, find something like a nursery area, you need to find fossils uh, from a given time period in a given area that, and enough of them to be able to tell something like that. Uh, probably the most uh, recent, and you might've heard about this, this was in the news fairly recently, uh, one of the ancestors to Megalodon, um, Otodus angustidens, uh, a nursery area is being reported from the coast of South Carolina. So from about 30 to 35 million years ago, uh, uh, again, my, my friend and colleague, uh, Robert Bosenecker and his student is publishing a paper on uh, an uh, auricula or angustidens nursery area from the coast of, of um, Carolina. So uh, we don't know uh, about any of the other species because we just don't have uh, the fossils and the right geologic time periods right now for uh, for that in Panama. Uh, Anna would like to know how many types of sharks are there in the world? Yeah, well, there's well over 500 species of sharks. And if we talk about all the cartilaginous fish, including stingrays and the rabbit fish or rat fishes, and the sawfishes, there's almost a thousand different species out there today. But the modern groups are the sharks, the, the, the rays and the skates, and then this group called the rabbit fishes or the chimeras. Those are the major groups that, that are still alive today. Uh, the next question is, is there any anywhere we can go to look for our own megalodon teeth? Uh, yeah, there are. Uh, unfortunately, not here in New Jersey. Probably the closest area is down along the coast of Maryland. Uh, the Calvert Cliffs of Maryland are probably the closest area where, where megalodon teeth are, are found with any regularity. Um, so you can look into that. There's a great, the Calvert Marine Museum has a great display. Um, and you just need to be uh, aware of any state and county and federal uh, laws about uh, collecting fossils. Um, but yeah, Florida is a great place for it. Uh, South Carolina is another place. A lot of people go scuba diving for, for megalodon teeth. Uh, so as I said, you know, uh, the prices of megalodon teeth can be quite astronomical, but they, they are not that uncommon. Uh, they're pretty common to be found. Uh, someone asked me, why did I to study, decide to study fossil sharks? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I actually grew up in Spring Lake Heights, New Jersey in Monmouth County. Uh, and when I was a little boy, um, I, you were allowed to collect in Shark River Park, which is a county park. Uh, you're not allowed to collect there anymore, but I started collecting shark teeth when I was a little boy. Uh, and you can still collect up at Big Brook uh, in northern Monmouth County. It's a different age, but you can still find shark teeth there. And so this is something I started doing when I was a little boy. And uh, growing up at the beach, I always loved uh, studying sharks and, and loved things about the ocean. Um, Jessica asked, was the Mosasaurus bigger than a Megalodon? Uh, depends on the species. The largest Mosasaur uh, in the Atlantic was Mosasaurus maximus or Mosasaurus hoffmani, uh, and we have a full mount of one of those on, in our museum hanging from the ceiling. Uh, they grew to be about 40 to 45 feet long, so it was very close, um, probably about 5 to 10 feet shorter than Megalodon. Uh, 
Um, so I would say Megalodon was bigger than the Mosasaurus. Uh, someone asked, how did Megalodon and other sharks survive the, the end of the Cretaceous mass extinction? Uh, well, again, Megalodon didn't show up for another 50 million years after that extinction. So uh, it didn't have to worry about it. Um, but how did other sharks survive? Um, well, we know that some did and some didn't. Uh, there's a lot of questions still surrounding why some uh, organisms survived that mass extinction and, while, and why others didn't. Uh, sharks probably uh, came through pretty okay uh, because uh, the, the waters of the ocean uh, don't change temperature that quickly or that easily. So while on land, if the sun was blocked out for a few months, uh, it could change the temperatures on land very quickly. Uh, seawater probably didn't change quite as fast. And uh, some of the ecosystems, we know some organisms like mosasaurs and plesiosaurs and the ammonites uh, do go extinct. Um, sharks seem to have made it through. Uh, not the same species, but a lot of uh, uh, smaller species. We do tend to find smaller teeth right after the, the Cretaceous uh, end extinction. Uh, are there any sharks uh, today that are under threat of extinction because of climate change? Uh, climate change is a difficult one to quantify when we talk about um, uh, threats for extinction for modern species. Uh, we know that a lot of sharks are threatened with extinction today, um, and a lot of that is due to overfishing, uh, especially the practice of shark finning, where sharks are captured and their fins are cut off um, uh, just for uh, things like shark fin soup, and then the sharks are dumped over the side. Um, I can't think of any sharks uh, off the top of my head at the moment that are specifically threatened due to climate change. Um, however, we know that um, environments are changing uh, fairly rapidly in some in some regions. Uh, Ria's mom would like to know, what kinds of sharks live off the coast of New Jersey? Uh, have I ever seen any sharks, uh, living sharks in the wild? Uh, yeah, there are um, well over, there are over 20 different species found off the coast of New Jersey, uh, including great whites and mako sharks. Uh, we have common threshers that are found off the coast of New Jersey, the, the ones with the long tails that stun their prey. Uh, occasionally, whale sharks will uh, come by in the, the Gulf Stream current. Uh, and then we have lots of other things. We have the spiny dogfish that are found here in New Jersey, uh, bull sharks, black tips. Uh, they're all uh, fairly common along uh, the New Jersey coast as well. So, yeah, quite a few species are found off the coast of New Jersey. And have I ever seen uh, in them myself? Uh, yeah, I'm not a scuba diver. But I uh, went to school at the University of Florida, and I had a few uh, uh, closer than I would have liked encounters with uh, some black tips swimming uh, off the coast of Florida. Uh, I also spent uh, a month in South Africa um, working with some shark researchers down there. And while they weren't alive, I got to study uh, some recently uh, uh, caught great whites and some other species as well. Uh, Jessica would like to know what's my favorite shark species. Well, uh, in the in the chat, I put mega mouth sharks, um, and that's because that's a, a giant species of shark. They're filter feeders. They grow to thirty five to forty feet long, and they weren't described by scientists until nineteen seventy six. So, can you imagine a thirty five forty foot long shark that wasn't described by science until? just about 50 years ago. I find that just extraordinary. And they are, they're extremely rare. They're very deep water sharks. They're very strange looking as well. Uh, so I like weird things. Um, uh, somebody asked, what kind of shark jaws are these behind me? Uh, these are the jaws of a great hammerhead. Uh, so these jaws came from Florida. Um, I was at graduate school in Florida and these were a set that were used for research and uh, these uh, came from a great hammerhead that was about uh, um, nine and a half or 10 feet long. So I used these um, both in research, but mainly in education uh, these days. 
why did I name the shark car Caradon Hubbleye? Does that name have any meaning? Uh, yes, it does. Um, we um, we use the name Carcaridon because it's in the same genus as the modern great white, and that was described back in, by Linnaeus in the 1750s. Uh, the name Hubbleye refers to uh, a, a gentleman named Gordon Hubble, and he lives down in Gainesville, Florida, and that amazing specimen I showed you from Peru uh, was a specimen that Gordon Hubble uh, helped collect and was part of his private collection. And when I was in graduate school uh, working on my PhD, uh, Dr. Hubble donated that specimen to the Florida Museum of Natural History so that it could be properly studied. And so I honored that species, uh, I named that species in honor of, of Dr. Hubble. And so uh, sometimes if you donate a specimen uh, that becomes very noteworthy in science, um, it's possible that scientists might name that, uh, if it's a new species, name it after you. So uh, I've named um, uh, three different extinct species, uh, two turtles and one shark uh, after people who donated fossils to the museums I was working at. Uh, the next question was, do I have a personal shark tooth collection? Um, the answer is no. Um, I have very few specimens that I show off and use for educational purposes, but everything that I collect goes to the museum that I work at. And so um, I do uh, collect quite a bit uh, here in New Jersey. Uh, and on average, I, I usually deposit, oh, probably two to 3,000 uh, teeth specimens in the New Jersey State Museum collections at this point. Uh, because uh, as a professional, uh, I don't think that it's right to have a, a private collection and it's really not ethically um, a good idea. So all of my specimens go right to my museum. And my final question for the evening is, what's the coolest place that you have been looking for sharks? Um, well, you know, as a paleontologist, I've gotten to travel all over the world for research and for um, uh, science uh, trips. Um, and I would say probably working down in the deserts of southern Peru uh, has been the most exciting. Uh, that area is very remote. It's near the Pacific Ocean. Um, but out in the deserts there, and I didn't have time to show pictures, but you can find fully articulated whale skeletons. Uh, some of them even have preserved baleen in their mouths. Uh, other things that have been found from those areas, uh, fossil giant penguins, four foot tall penguins. Um, we found uh, dolphins that had tusks like a walrus um, and all kinds of uh, sloths that swam in the ocean and ate sea grasses. Uh, so uh, it was a really exciting time. And while I was down there the first time back in 2007, uh, I actually was in an earthquake, an 8.0 earthquake that hit Peru. Uh, so it was exciting for a whole number of reasons. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Aaron. Now, this was a wonderful presentation. I learned a lot about Trump, <laughs> more than I knew. Uh, that was outstanding. And uh, we want to thank you for your time and uh, to our audience for coming in and had great questions uh, for the night. Um, we are going to be live again. This was our late night and we will have our April late night, the first Wednesday of April. But before that, we actually have our um, next Ask a Geologist with Glacial Landscapes with Luke Sowet. Uh, that is going to be on Friday, Friday, March 12th. So we, we hope you enjoy the night. Um, and I want to encourage everybody to hang in there. Thank you for participating of our virtual activities and hopefully soon we will be able to reopen our museums and be able to go to the New Jersey State Museum and also to the Geology Museum. Can't wait for that to happen. Have a good night, everybody, and thank you for your attention. Bye.